to the conclusion that one useless man is called a disgrace, that two are called a law firm, and that three or more become a congress. <laughs> oh, Winston Churchill and Pevensies. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Oh, hello. Thanks to YouTube's delightful statistical records, I have learned that my recent Dragon Ball-related videos have earned me a considerable following from the teenage sect. And now I'm going to alienate all of them by talking about a 40-year-old musical. <laughs> oh. Seventeen seventy six, the 1972 Columbia film based on the Broadway musical, tells the story of the oft-overlooked historical figure, John Adams, a few decades before he became president as a member of the Second Continental Congress. Little John has a dream. American independence. Convincing his fellow delegates would be a simple task except for one little problem. They all consider him obnoxious and disliked. Obnoxious and disliked. And it seems that I'm obnoxious and disliked. Did you know that? I hadn't heard. Therefore, he must sing and dance his way into the hearts of his peers, learning to compromise and get along in order to captivate them into breaking away from Great Britain. Yes, this actually exists. Along the way, he recruits in his quest for freedom Dr. Benjamin Franklin, portrayed captivatingly and whimsically by Howard De Silva, I like it. and Thomas Jefferson, wonderfully brought to life by Ken Howard. Virginia abstains as they slowly but surely transform into the men they're remembered for. But I admit that what first drew me to this film was the fact that the star of the film, John Adams, is portrayed by none other than the great William Daniels. As a child of the early 90s, I of course know him as Mr. George Feeney of Boy Meets World, just as children of the 80s would certainly recognize that voice as Kit from Knight Rider. But didn't you ever wonder why the high school in Boy Meets World was named John Adams High? Obscure nerdy trivia you neither knew nor cared about. But it's worth the price of admission alone just to get to hear Mr. Feeney say things like this. I'm only 41, I still have my virility. And I can romp through Cupid's Grove with great agility. But life is more than sexual combustibility. On the surface, it almost seems a ridiculously poor fit to try to merge one of the most important moments in American history with musical comedy, but amazingly it works. With its slight irreverence, it can often make the transition from riotously funny to engagingly serious in a moment, and the eclectic mix manages to be both extremely entertaining as well as educational. Granted, there are of course a few hiccups in the historical accuracy for a dramatic sake. Of course, my favorite is Jefferson's I have already resolved to release my slaves. Um, yeah, in about 50 years after I die and no longer require their services. That sounds fair, doesn't it? But just so you know, the whole part about the Continental Congress randomly breaking into choreographed song and dance numbers, that's totally true. No embellishments there. And what a delight all the musical numbers are. Sherman Edwards' songs are clever and catchy, and Anna White's choreography is fun and rambunctious. And yet there's a simplicity to it all. There aren't any twinkling lights or huge choruses of dancing girls or acrobatics or overblown visuals. In fact, one of the best songs consists simply of Jefferson, Franklin, and Adams sitting on a step. I find it quite interesting that when you look at modern film adaptations of musicals, they always seem to want to throw in all kinds of expressionistic detail and swooping shots and visuals in what I assume is their attempt to seem more flamboyantly theatrical. Yet 1776 genuinely feels like a theater piece in its understatement, which is apparently what the aging Jack Warner wanted when he agreed to produce it. And as a result of Warner's insistence that the film match what he saw on stage as closely as possible, nearly all the cast were from the original Broadway production, and it shows. Again, to talk about the elegant simplicity is to talk about how Peter Hunt filmed it. There isn't an abundance of close-ups or coverage. In fact, many scenes, particularly the scenes in Congress, play out in long masters where the camera slowly travels around different parts of the room without ever cutting to another shot, which is something you rarely see anymore. 
Obviously, in a shot like that, if one actor messes up, the entire shot is ruined, which is a clear advantage to having theater-trained actors who know how to act continuously without needing the constant cuts that film often allows. I also can't forget to praise Peter Stone's screenplay, which apparently calls much of its material from actual quotes of the historical personages and even pokes fun at Franklin's easily quotable sayings. Those who give up some of their liberty in order to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. My favorite usage of this foul material is in the conversations between John and his wife Abigail. Well, I say conversations, but I really mean correspondences since they are never actually in the same location during the entire film, but they instead converse through their letters. You never actually see any letters, though, because the film represents it as them talking to each other. She will often just appear next to him in Philadelphia, or he will appear with her on their farm in Boston. It's just such a great device that works so well, and yet the unity of the setting is never forsaken as the two lovers are never allowed to actually touch each other, even as they appear to be sitting right next to one another. It's almost heartbreaking in a way, but at the same time provides some of the most uplifting sequences of the entire story. Now, unfortunately, I must discuss the cons, of which there are few, but they are necessary to discuss. I have to preface this by stating that one of my college professors once told me that the reason characters sing in musicals is because they have something to express, something so important, something so ready to burst from within them that mere words are simply not enough to convey it. Therefore, as far as I see it, the songs in a musical are the most pivotal moments and cannot just be thrown in lightly. After all, it takes less than a second for someone to say he's sad, but two minutes to devote a song to it. So if you're going to have a song, you better have a damn good reason for it, and a damn good song. Unfortunately, even a lot of the best musicals fall victim to believing that only the latter is enough justification. But you have to remember that songs in a musical are just another storytelling device, and if your song isn't developing the plot or character, you're basically bringing your story to a grinding halt so your characters can do a little singing and dancing. And while most of the songs in 1776 advance the plot, there are a couple that I consider to be vanity songs. The first of which is the Lees of Old Virginia. One could argue that the song advances the plot by convincing Richard Henry Lee to propose independence in place of John Adams, but all of that's accomplished in the preceding dialogue. This song is clearly a character song about Richard Henry Lee, which would be okay except for the fact that this is pretty much the only significant thing he does in the entire film. I remember seeing this for the first time and assuming he would be a major character because of this song, but you barely see him before this, and you barely see him after this, so I couldn't have wondering what the point was. The other song is Martha Jefferson's He Plays the Violin, and for all the same reasons except that this is an even greater offender. The character of Martha Jefferson literally has no other role in this film except to sing this song. She enters in order to sing it, and then you never see her again after she sings it. The only real purpose this song serves is to let the audience know that Thomas Jefferson is a good lover and plays the violin. Which is all fine and dandy, except for the fact that those two points of interest are entirely irrelevant to the story. Conversely, in But Mr. Adams, they spend a good deal of time singing about what a great writer Thomas Jefferson is, information that is indeed relevant since he has to write the Declaration of Independence. Don't get me wrong, I love both of those songs, and Ron Holgate's performance in the Lees of Old Virginia and him a Tony, and deservedly so. When I'm skipping around the film just to listen to songs, both of those are pretty high on my list of songs to watch. The performances are great, the songs are fun and entertaining, and the choreography is some of, if not, the best in the entire show. However, they both bring the story to a grinding halt. All that said, though, I would hesitate before saying they don't belong in the film. After all, the writers of Back to the Future freely admit that the Johnny B. Good sequence stops the story in favor of spectacle, and they almost cut it from the picture at the last minute for that very reason. I'm certainly glad they didn't. So, maybe on certain occasions, the story can be allowed to take a rest if what takes its place is entertaining enough to give the momentum a shot in the arm. Well, somebody must like those numbers, since my VHS cover image is from the Lees of Old Virginia, and the DVD cover is Thomas and Martha Jefferson in an embrace. And I think whoever designed the DVD cover needs to be kicked in the shins for designing the most inappropriate and misleading cover ever, and that includes the covers for the Batman serials DVDs. I'm glad they remembered to put Martha front and center when she's only in one scene. That's certainly worth neglecting to put the main character on the cover at all. One more thing I should mention, since I basically already did, is that I managed to scrounge up both the VHS and the DVD for this review. The VHS is annoyingly pan and scan, but it's the original theatrical cut, which unfortunately has been supplanted on the DVD with the restored director's cut. See, I don't believe in recutting films. I believe the theatrical version should be the only version, even when, as in this case, Richard Nixon coerces you into deleting the villain song, Cool Considerate Men. I think it's a really great song, and unlike the ones I previously mentioned, it actually fits in the story, but it's so ham-handedly political that I can't help but groan at times. 
we'll dance together to the same minuet to the right ever to the right never to the left forever to the right wow that's just so subtle anyway it would have been nice if the dvd could have had both versions branching because now i feel incomplete both ways I can watch the director's cut in pristine quality, but in order to watch the theatrical version, I have to settle for losing two-thirds of the picture. For a film that is so much about history, it seems a shame that the history of the film might be erased, as much of a shame that those elements that were originally cut were intended by Jack Warner to be erased from history. But now let me get off my soapbox and finish this review. Oh, you ask why I didn't go over the plot like I usually do in my reviews? Oh, good God. It's the Declaration of Independence. Do you really need me to tell you whether or not John Adams convinces the Congress to sign it? Well, if so, you'll just have to watch the movie and find out. And even if you're one of those few who do know how it ends, you should definitely check it out anyway. It's probably the most fun you'll ever have learning history, and who better to teach it to you than good old Mr. Feeney? I have such a desire to knock heads together. Oh, those Beatles and their song.